The golden age of the steam railway was built on foundations of hard work, on skilled work, on dedication. How often are steam locomotives described as being alive, as more animal than machine, as living, breathing creatures, creatures, machines, that have personality. Just like living creatures, locomotives need tending, feeding, watering and grooming. The working day of a steam locomotive begins early with a full ritual of preparation before taking to the road. Fires to be lit, steam to be raised, with feeding and watering. The joints and tendons through which pass the locomotive's power and strength need to be lubricated and exercised. Light oils and heavier greases for the running gear as metal slides up against and over metal at high speeds. Heavy oils for the cylinders designed to atomize under the heat and pressures of the locomotive to become microscopic particles flowing into the cylinders and valves along with the steam. The smell of the emulsified oil and steam mixture giving rise to one of the distinctive sensations of the steam railway. In the golden age of the steam railway, the steam locomotive reached its greatest ever level of technical sophistication. It was a time when the art of locomotive design attained its greatest achievements. And it was a time when some lucky passengers were carried in incredible comfort and style.
In a time when the steam locomotive lives on only in preservation and living museums, as cherished and venerated objects cleaned, looked after, photographed and videoed, as a thing to be wondered at, puzzled by and scared of, it is fascinating to see the world of the classic steam railway where steam was every day and nothing to be excited about. The fastest everyday journeys were made by the old-fashioned looking locomotives of the Great Western Railway. Their quaint looking locomotives took advantage of easy routes and long stretches of flat straight track to make the fastest average journey times. A product of Brunel's excellent civil engineering nearly 100 years before. The PR machine of the Great Western turned rather obscure express trains such as the Cheltenham Flyer into some of the most famous services in the world by merit of the high overall journey speed. Great Western locomotives were not quite as old-fashioned as they looked. They may have looked rather Victorian with brass and copper rather than chrome and silver, with cabs that engine men found uncomfortable. But underneath, they shared many of the inventions that made their more sleek and streamlined competitors so powerful. The Great Western was a very stylish railway. The GWR invented retro style before the term was ever used. Its locomotives had a continuity of design that lasted nearly the whole life of the railway. It's important to put the streamliners in perspective. Most of the British railway system was run by locomotives that were old in 1930. In 1939, the speeds of the LNER's non-streamlined services were not much faster than in 1913. The everyday train that did not get into the newsreel belonged to a world that had a different idea of distance to that we know today. Then there were no long distance commuters as today. Even from towns in today's terms as close as 200 miles, the first trains might not reach London much before midday. Trains were not crowded, there was a vast oversupply of seats. For some cities, there were as many as five different competing routes from London. Not having a compartment all to yourself was regarded as a hardship. Trains were longer and heavier than today. Fifteen coaches were not unusual. A railway's identity was not simply its characteristic locomotives and carriages. Every smallest detail was typical and undoubtedly one of the most atmospheric and attractive features of the steam railway was the signalling. The sound of bells and the crash of levers echoing down onto a station platform is one of the most evocative experiences of the railway past. Each railway had its own characteristic design of signal box equipment. The cleanliness of the signal box with spotless interior seems a direct contrast to the grimy, smoke-laden exterior world of the locomotive. The signalling equipment represented in its time the cutting edge of technology. It could be argued that there has been little progress, that there is no improvement later technology could bring that would radically improve the safety of mechanical signalling. The end of the mechanical signal box has just made signalling cheaper and less labour intensive, not better. The eye can delight in identifying a signal as the product of a particular railway. These pressed steel signal arms mounted on a latticed post are characteristically southern. Just as this gantry bears the signature of the Great Western. As does its signal box. One of the major safety concerns in operating a single track line is of two trains travelling in opposite directions. Careful methodical working on the part of the signalman was not regarded as enough to ensure safety and a technical answer was needed. This problem was solved by the invention of the token machine. 
The token was a bar, often shaped like a giant key, permitting a train to enter a section of single track. The tokens are locked into a system so that only one token can be released at a time, and so only one train on the line at a time. This gives rise to one of the picturesque sights of the steam railway, that of signalmen and firemen exchanging tokens. So, this is a great western signal box. Now for a railway which in so many ways was defiantly old-fashioned, the Great Western was one of the advanced in terms of safety, and in the 1930s it invented and protected all its main line routes with an automatic train control system, here methodically explained by one of the railway's drivers. This invention is called the automatic train control and makes travelling much safer. It also avoids much delay during foggy weather. When the signals are at danger, the siren blows dust. Which automatically brings the train to a standstill. When the signals are in the all right position, the bell rings thus. Both the siren and the bell are worked by a shoe fitted to the engine which comes in contact with a ramp fixed to the permanent way. The steam railway of course ran on coal. Locomotives visibly consume their fuel. There is no silent falling of a gauge. The fuel is consumed before the eye. This feeling that the machine is eating is one of the things that makes locomotives have personality. When at rest, the fire burns steadily. When at speed, working hard, the fire roars as the locomotive sucks a powerful blast of air through the fire and the coal bursts into flame almost as it leaves a shovel. What makes good coal? Coal which is small and full of dust will be wasted blowing straight out of the chimney without burning but over large lumps will burn unevenly, steaming inefficiently. way coal is stored is important. Hard coals exposed to the weather break up and crumble and much of the energy value simply evaporates slowly away into the air. Now the fireman's job varies from engine to engine. The box of this tank engine is comparatively small. But those of the largest locomotives, here an A4 Pacific, were giant expanses of flame representing a titanic task to the fireman. A job for the fit and the strong. 
The fireman's job is not simply to shovel coal, but to maintain the supply of steam involving a constant monitoring of boiler pressure and water level. A splendid way to travel, but it was not efficient. At best, only a quarter of the energy available was actually used to boil water. What is now the job of the van and lorry delivering the individual load and the small consignment was the job of the stopping goods train, where small loads were picked up from the smallest and most local of stations and from a multitude of private sidings attached to factories and dispatched around the country. Individual wagons would be shunted and sorted, joining and leaving several different trains until eventually arriving at another small and local station. The goods train will be a colourful and varied assembly that combine wagons from different places, from different railways and different industries, a sight that was never quite the same twice. was a national British railway, was there such a thing as a typical British locomotive? If there is a typical British locomotive, it is the 060, be it an 060 tender or an 060 tank. These locos were the staple workhorses to be found on freight and passenger traffic alike. 
At nationalisation of the 20,000 engines British Railways owned, more than one in three were 060s. When BR came to build its own locomotives, no 060s were built. Locomotive policy was one of the first areas where the new British Railways had to go to work and integrate the big four into one system. It was decided in 1951 to build a whole new family of standard locomotives that could eventually work the whole system. Just ten designs. The wisdom of this is debatable. Other developed countries were investing in diesel and electric traction. Only three years later, the decision was taken to phase out steam altogether on Britain's railways. A wasteful change of mind. Many of those locomotives built in the 1950s would have had useful lives nearly to the present day. What was the idea, the basic thought that guided the designers of these standard locomotives? Maximum steam raising capacity, huge efficient boilers for each type of loco to guarantee plenty of power, high thermal efficiency making maximum use of the energy from the coal burned with large grates and internal steam circuitry and valves of the highest standards, simplicity as few working parts to look after and those parts to be easily reached and on view. For example, on this standard five locomotive, there is a simple arrangement of just two outside cylinders. There are no difficult to get at internal cylinders and motion. Key components were to be highly engineered, drawing on the lessons and developments in technology that the war had brought. The tender of the Class 5 has roller bearings on its axles, more reliable and needing far less maintenance. The idea of low maintenance and higher efficiency is carried throughout the design of the locomotive. The locomotive is fitted with a then innovatory oil pump, a mechanical oiler here being primed. This reduced the number of individual oilings needed before each journey. Some parts of the locomotive had sealed lubricating points, again all leading to less expensive labour and time in preparing the engine for the road. For there was drastic need to cut labour costs as people were far more expensive in the post-war years and had far higher expectations. A low paid job which involved getting up very early to work with dirty and hot locomotives did not attract applicants in the fifties. Of course the extensive ritual of oiling and general preparation was still time consuming and that time spent before the run was mirrored by a long period spent disposing of the engine after a run. Equally, the new engines were to be easier to put to bed at night, with features such as a self-cleaning smoke box to remove one of the most dirty and unpleasant tasks in tending to steam locomotives. Wheel arrangement and weight were optimized to ensure good adhesion and minimal slipping, making the new locomotives extremely sure-footed. The locos were to have the range of power and speed such that each class could handle mixed traffic be as happy handling an express or a freight. Pulling a light train very fast or a heavy train powerfully if slowly. These last steam locomotives to be built include among their number some of the most spectacular successes in locomotive design. In many ways they succeeded in the aim of bringing together some of the very best principles from each of the old big four. It is a sadness, a waste of human ingenuity that so many good working locomotives were to have such a short working life.
Steam locomotives, more than any other form of transport, give the feel of a living creature, of something that has to be fed. This scene of coaling is timeless, something that's been happening for 150 years. Fed and watered. Of something that has to be nursed through its journey, a locomotive is not the easiest of things to drive well. Now, each and every type of transport that people use has its own feel. What then is the feel of being in the cab, of driving a locomotive? In some ways, driving a locomotive is like the more familiar experience of driving a car when starting, selecting a low gear, a late cutoff on the reversing gear, taking off the brake, pressing the accelerator, opening the regulator to send power to the wheels, the engine slowly starts to move. Steel wheels on steel rails do not move with the same response of rubber on tarmac and the locomotive is gently encouraged up to speed. Once moving and picking up speed, the cutoff is changed, the equivalent of changing to a higher gear. Driving of steam locomotive is of course a two-person job, with extra work from the fireman in response to the engine working harder. The fireman watches steam pressure and water level, and has a cab floor to be kept clear of loose coal. The engine beats faster as it works harder, climbing, doing more work, burning more coal. None of the great engineers ever satisfactorily solved the simple problem of looking past a long boiler barrel to watch ahead and spot signals. So it is a job of both crew to work together, look forward, checking both signals and the road ahead. Knowledge of the road is important to driving all trains, more so on steam, when so much has to be done in addition to simply driving. The sensation of the cab is one of noise, of vibration, of being in the open air, directly aware of the environment through which the train runs, of feeling the locomotive work, of understanding its condition by vibration and sound, rather than the simple inspection of dial and gauges. This was a time when engine crews had more contact with others on the railway. For engine crews in the age of steam, the signalman was not a remote presence many miles away. Trains were not controlled by automatic signals. of the steam railway was more than simply the sight, sound and smell of the steam locomotive. The experience of the steam railway was the total of a mass of small details.
the sound of trucks and wagons which were simply chained together rather than precisely coupled. Of a world which was lit not by electricity but by oil lamps. Even there. Oil lamps shone down on a pre-microwave, pre-fiber optic world with a communications technology worked with simple telegraph wires. Signaling which was mechanical, mirroring and mimicking human gesture, where the area control was limited by a man's strength conveyed through wire and rod. The sound of wheel running on rail in the classic age was different. This was a time when 60 foot lengths of rail, bolted, not welded together, sat wedged in place by wooden keys and cast iron chairs, bolted to wooden sleepers. Trains don't sound like this anymore. of the end came in 1960. Swindon and a new locomotive that's already historic. The last steam loco to be built by British Railways. The official unveiling revealed its appropriate name. Evening Star points to the inevitable end of a very popular age, the age of steam. It's always been locos like this that made boys want to be engine drivers. An innocent might ask, why aren't steam locomotives used anymore? The answer is simple. What would you have to pay someone to tend to a steam locomotive's needs? Labouring for money rather than love. What a steam locomotive wants, what it needs, is a lot. A lot of care and attention. This great western manor class 460 has spent a day working up and down the preserved Seven Valley Railway. It has finished its day's work. But for those whose task it is to care for this engine, to make certain it stays a healthy engine, the day's work is not even half over. The first task is to coal the locomotive. It is easier to move to the coal when there is steam than to move a locomotive without steam. The crew of a steam locomotive cannot switch off, lock up and go home. As the engine returns to its base, people gather around, each waiting to play their role in the rituals of engine disposal. At one end, new fuel is loaded into the tender. Meanwhile, at the other, one of the most unpleasant jobs on the steam railway begins. As coal burns, and just as any fuel, it does not burn completely, some ash remains. While the locomotive is running, this ash is sucked through the boiler tubes. Some is blown out through the chimney, but some gathers and collects in the smoke box. For all but a small number of engines, there is no alternative but for someone to open the hot smoke box and shovel the ash out. Shoveled by hot, dirty and dusty shovel, 
To do the thorough job needed means to get right inside the box of the still hot locomotive, reaching right inside with special tools to reach into every nook and cranny of the engine. In the cab a start is made on cleaning the fire. The smoke box door is cleaned to make certain of the airtight fit which is needed when running for the engine's exhaust system to do its job properly. The door is screwed very tight. forward on its remaining steam. The engine will now remain static for the rest of its disposal. The boiler is filled with water. Once again, this is something much harder to do with a cold engine, as boiler pressure is needed to work the injectors, the taps connecting the tender to boiler. This gradually cools the engine and reduces the boiler pressure. Then comes the task of removing the fire. Again, on some of the more modern engines, the fire can be dropped through the bottom of the firebox. But here, it has to be shoveled out by hand and dropped through the floor of the cab. Hot work, cramped work, using cumbersome large tools in a small space. It is this, the simple amount of labor needed to make the engines work that brought about the end of steam. West Country, a small local train hurries by on a branch line, perhaps soon to be axed. On the Great Western Main Line, a castle destined for scrap thunders by. What would enthusiasts give to spend a day just watching through these windows overlooking the Paddington approaches in the early 1960s?
Today, the names of the old railways live on the preserved lines of Britain. Locomotives, perhaps with new boilers and new wheels, still work, perhaps on lines that are a little too small for their power. The names of famous expresses live on, adorning locomotives that are not perhaps quite right, as the stars of countless home movies. The steam locomotive is probably one of those technologies which, if it were to be invented today, would not be allowed. counting accountant will give a host of reasons why you cannot run a commercial railway based on burning coal to boil water to make steam. The truth remains that as long as there are steam locomotives in this world, there will be people who will want to clean them, oil them, fire them, drive them, photograph them, film them. Thank you.